Lead us in. Hello and welcome to the skating lesson. Today we are thrilled to welcome multi, multi uh, world and Olympic medalist coach, coach of numerous national champions, John Nix. Welcome to the skating lesson. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, we were going to ask you when you were last in the ice rink, but we were just checking Instagram and we saw a picture of you uh, with all of Jenny and Todd's teams at the ice rink today. So how often do you work? Do you see them? And how often are you still on the ice? Well, you know, I live in Baja in Mexico and uh, come up to this area um, about two or three times a month. And, um, uh, you know, I've been good friends with Todd and Jenny uh, for many, many, many years. And uh, it's always nice to visit with them and see what they're doing. And it's a uh, sort of gratifying to know that they've had so much success as they have, particularly it seems recently. What is it like for you to watch all of their teams at nationals? They've been doing so well, having, you know, first and second place. And how often do you talk to them about, you know, coaching all of these teams? Well, I remember talking to, to Todd when, um, I think his pairs came first and second in nationals. And uh, I said to him, uh, well, I think you beat me because I never think I did that myself. <laughs> <laughs> what is their coaching How style? Like? Oh, yeah. What, Jennifer? <laughs> are you, are you, are you, laughing at, what is... are you laughing at me or you, who are you laughing at? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I wanted, Dave wanted to know what is their coaching style like? much better than mine um, you know mine's a little old-fashioned these days and uh, they're really with it and uh, uh, both pairs were training very well today it's amazing how the uh, the new pair have come together so quickly uh, I think a lot of it must have been due to Jenny and Todd's coaching so remarkable how quickly they've done it so how closely, Mr. Nix, do you follow skating? Well, my son, Christopher, he knows a lot more about it these days than I do. And he keeps me pretty well informed. And of course, I watch it on television. And uh, it's all very interesting and very new to me. And uh, it's amazing how the sport has uh, changed, uh, particularly athletically. I, I can't believe when I look at these uh, young Russian and Japanese skater, it's just unbelievable. Hmm. Well, so many of those <laughs> Russian skaters, they copy moves that you and Sasha Cohen came up with together. Many of her spins, Yulevnitskaya used. They all try to do the skid that Sasha did on the ice, but they don't get the same flexibility or extension that she did. So are you flattered when you see that? Do you cringe when they try to do the skid and their leg is here? Or, you know, what is it like for you to watch? Well, you know, Sasha was a very special skater and, uh, she had a lot of natural attributes and uh, I never seemed to have to work it very hard. I always said that uh, whenever she fell, it seemed to be gracefully getting up from it <laughs> and very difficult to catch her in, a, in an ugly position. And, uh, you know, can't take anything away from the Russian skaters. They must train very well and very courageous. And, uh, but of course, uh, um, artistically, they don't really come close. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any skaters today who really impress you, who really catch your eye? Well, I, I think the uh, I think the last year's ladies champion. I mean, you know, she's had some growing issues as all young skaters do. But and although she, I think, omitted some of her most difficult moves, I really thought she stayed in there very well and, uh, you know, has probably gone through a difficult period and gone through it, it very well. And I'm expecting good things uh, in the future there. And, uh, uh, you know, I might be biased, but the, uh, the pairs that the Todd have, I think, are going to uh, register on the world scene where we've been, been very difficult with pairs lately. And, but I think we have a good chance with those two. You, know, you talked about a difficult period, and we all went through a difficult period this past year with quarantine. So, how did you keep yourself busy, and where were you quarantining? 
What was that again? Did, this past year, where were you quarantining and how did you keep yourself busy and, and your mind busy, your body busy at home this past year? Well, I try and keep um, pretty, pretty fit. You know, I'm nearly 92 years old and uh, I still do a lot of uh, running and training for 5K in, in about six weeks and uh, trying to keep up with the skating scene because I'm still very interested in it. And it's of course been very good to me over the years. So how did you get started running races and how often are you currently you know, training for them? Well, I, I, I ran a 5K like two years ago and last year I was going to, but of course it was canceled. So there's one near my 92nd birthday in April. So I'm trying to get uh, to it there. And, uh, you know, I've always liked challenges and as a coach you always have challenges and I really wanted to uh, to have some even this advanced age. Do you train yourself like you would if you were one of your skaters? How what is your approach to training when it comes to your running? Oh I just did it you know every day on the on the treadmill or I live on the beach in Rosarito in Baja and running on the beach, which is nice. And, you know, these sort of activities are a little painful sometimes, but you always seem to have a good feeling of accomplishment once it's, uh, once it's done. So you seem as sharp as ever. So what do you credit that to? Well, sharp as ever, it depends, you know, how sharp I ever was. Uh, <laughs> so you have to- uh, be careful. What? You're running it's sharper than most, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it all depends who you've been talking to lately. <laughs> well, at 10 years old, Mr. Nix, I read that you started skating because your dad owned a sporting goods shop and he wanted That's to right. see what skates would be like on the ice. That's right. I was so sort of a he... sort of a guinea pig. He tried out a lot of different Bigger skates, uh, and uh, that's how I got started. You're quite right. So, was skating something that you just took to naturally, or was it something that it took a while for you to fall in love with the sport? What are your early memories? Well, it enabled me to uh, get out of some school classes. I remember that. That was a gratifying, and um, I just uh, just enjoyed it. And as time went on, I enjoyed the travel, uh, particularly I trained in winters in Switzerland. It was very nice. And uh, I, I, I enjoyed it because it was, it was a little different then. You know, I, I never skated from the season used to end in April, May, and I, I never put skates on until uh, September. And uh, it was a nice break, but you, you can't really compare what happened. I remember in the... Uh, it was in 1948 Olympics I skated in uh, St. Moritz in Switzerland. And uh, about halfway through, the, I was in pairs, and about halfway through the uh, competition, the snow started to fall, and we did our program in snow, and they had to stop the competition every three uh, sets of competitors and sweep the ice rink. And uh, afterwards, it was an Olympic Games, and... Uh, I think I counted about seven uh, news people there. So things have changed a little. <laughs> well, you talk about those Olympics and you skated with your sister at the Olympics yes. as a pair skater. And I also read that the British Skating Federation asked you and your sister to skate together. And they said that they would fund your skating. So were you hesitant at all to skate pairs with your sister? Well, a couple of corrections there. They never funded any skating at all. <laughs> okay. That did, didn't have any money. And, um, uh, but I really paired my sister because I, we were skating solo and I was a soloist and I won the, uh, the UK junior men's title as a soloist. Of course, there was only one other competitor and they weren't very good. And it was obvious to everybody that my career as a singles was somewhat limited. And so we had a better chance with pairs. So uh, we did, and uh, fortunately we did. My, my sister was always much better skater than I was. I, mean, I remember in the, uh, 
pay a program. I always, in the program, place her double jumps uh, between me and the judges so they couldn't see me very well. And, um, and she's always much better than I was. I was uh, probably a little smarter than she was. How did you balance your relationship as siblings with your partnership on the ice? What were your personality types like? Oh, I was pretty objectionable. I don't know how she put up with me all those years. She was a uh, really nice, nice young lady. Very nice. Uh, I think she proved that <clears throat> you could be a very successful competitor and be a nice person at the same time. So I was all admired her and um, always a treasure the years we had together. It was a long time. I think we started together nine, eight or nine and finished with a a world championship in, uh, I think, about 15 years later. So Dick Button would always mention, you know, you being in the same Olympics that he was in. So what were your impressions of him as a skater? Mr. Fassi? Um, Dick Button. Dick Button. Dick Button uh, was just incredible. I mean, the only competition he lost over in Europe was the first year he came, and he should have won that, there's no doubt about it. He was the sort of person that before the competition started, you knew with absolute certainty who would win, and it was always Dick. Um, he was uh, light years ahead of his competition, and um, uh, every year, uh, he and his uh, coach, Lucy, Gus Lucy, would arrive at uh, competition and the second day, I always remember he, he had a press conference and he introduced to the uh, news people Dick's latest jump. It's always one better than last year. And so he was managed wonderfully and uh, just nobody, nobody like him. Nobody has dominated figure skating, I don't think, in the way that he did over the four or five years he competed in Europe. How would you describe yourself as a skater and a competitor? Well, indescribable. Um, uh, of course, you can't really see what you can do because in those days, you must remember this was 60, 70 years ago, they didn't have the sort of television and uh, anything on picture. So I couldn't see the uh, somewhat ghastly positions I used to get in, but my uh, coach used to tell me, of course, about that. Well, after finishing ninth at the Olympics in 1948, you and your sister went on to win three world medals and then finished fourth at the games in 1952. Were you disappointed with that fourth place finish? And how did you rebound then to win the world title in 1953? Uh, you're talking about the pair title with my sister? Yes. Yeah. Well, we won the pair title in 1953. And of course, that was the year after the Olympics. So as you know, after the Olympic Games, most of the good skaters retire or turn professional. So 1953 was a somewhat easier challenge. And uh, you know, we won it in Davos, so again on outside ice. And my sister and I had been training there for quite a while and, uh, and happened to uh, do a clean program. So. Uh, you know, I got out of that pretty quickly afterwards. Was it exhilarating for you? <laughs> so level, but were you, you know, was it very exciting? Well, things were different there. I remember we skated um, to probably in the middle of the day and it was sunshiny, it was nice weather. And uh, what I enjoyed was that afterwards we won the title. We, all the top competitors went out to the uh, local palace hotel for a tea dance. and. I can remember that perhaps a little better than the competition. I had more fun anyway. <laughs> well, after you retired from competitive skating, you were a show skater. And I yes. read you stopped show skating when you hurt, you injured your foot. So how did you get into coaching? Well, I, uh, I after, after a tour in, uh, in England, mostly in London, I went with a, uh, touring show to South Africa. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it was on the first night of the show, I, I, uh, my skate caught in a, in a rut, off the ice actually, and 
uh, broke a bone in my foot. So I was out and um, my sister continued to skate in the show and I didn't have anything to do. So I uh, started teaching the local skaters and then I began to enjoy the life in South Africa and um, stayed there and, and started to, to enjoy coaching very much. And, uh, you know, looking, looking back on the last uh, 50, 60 years, I'm, I, I'm much, much more impressed with my coaching career than I was with my skating career. <laughs> Following the 1961 plane crash, you came to the United States, and I read that Dick Button was instrumental in bringing you here to the U.S. and started coaching in Paramount, California. Who were your first U.S. skaters that you worked with? Um, well, I was sort of lucky. Um, I, I advertised in the skating paper for a position. I'd always admired American skaters all the time. They came to Europe and they were well prepared and confident and uh, jumping twice as high as anybody else. So I always wanted to come to America. And um, I uh, had four job openings I could go to and I picked uh, Long Beach with uh, at Paramount with Mr. Zamboni's uh, rink. And incidentally, mm -hmm. Mr. Zamboni is one of the great sort of people that, that helped me along, made me understand the ice skating business. And the first skaters of any note, I think, were the pair of um, Ken Shelley and Jojo Starbuck, who I think won the title three or four times. And I was particularly proud of Kenny, who I think was in 1972, uh, 70, 71 or 72, he won the senior men's title and the pair title in the same nationals, which is uh, not easy to do. Well, your skaters have always been known for their beautiful positions and really wonderful stroking. You know, you really have a, an, an immense attention to detail. Is that something that you've always been passionate about? You know, how did that develop in your skaters? It developed with my years with the Oscar Page organization. Um, I was uh, responsible for the coaching program in 22 rinks, and also was involved in the principal, the principal skating in the capades. And um, I started to be more aware of the importance of audiences in skating, both professional skating and in amateur skating. You know, even in our championships today, the rule states that the skater, the judges should not be influenced by an audience reaction. But we know that's nonsense. Uh, we know that uh, standing ovations uh, usually get very good marks. And also in the show, uh, I began to understand, they told me, the director of the show told me, please, when you involve your choreography, don't forget the cheap seats. The cheap seats mm -hmm. are you know, way up in an arena and you have to learn to project up to there. And uh, you have to be aware of an audience at all times. So. I've tried to bring that in, into my coaching lot and aware of the audience and understanding how important to a skater an audience is. Now, are you somebody who really regrets the loss of figures or do you think that it's you know, not damaged the sport? When I um, was at a, uh, a governing council meeting, when this subject came up many years ago, I spoke in favor of the abolition of school figures. Uh, the reason, reasons I gave were that it was becoming financially very difficult, uh, that school figures had no relationship to freestyle at all. The arguments I made were that in school figures, a good school, school figure skater main, tried to maintain the same speed from beginning to end, not to lose speed. Um, a free skater was taught to have to look at tracings, which basically are down on the ice, which is looking down. Um, the skaters that I train mostly hated school figures. They always asked me to, to play music while they was practicing a patch. And when I asked them why, they said they 
wanted music to take their mind off the figures. Um, and usually uh, it, you didn't have to be a great figure skater to be a good freestylist. And I can remember a young man I taught um, who uh, was just a great freestyle skater and, and it was, his name was Wagenhofer and mm -hmm. uh, always got about 12th place on the figures and came up on the uh, freestyle. So those are the reasons. Now, I've had some second thoughts about it over the last few years. When, you know, you talk to a, a, a novice or junior skater and they don't really understand the difference between a rocker and a counter or a bracket and never heard sometimes of them. Uh, I begin to wonder, but I think, I still think that the, the reasons uh, the reasons to abolish those figures were probably right looking towards the future. They could never, they could never stay, I don't think. Mm. You, you know, we had advanced had, uh, um, issues when, you know, a great figure skater was not a very good freestyle. And from the public and news point of view, those results seem to be uh, very strange. So um, I think overall, it's probably for the best. I don't think, I don't think anybody wants to go back now. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, one of the things, as I watch skinny today, that I think is missing, particularly from the Russian women, is a posture that we've seen from most of your students and the turnout. So I'm wondering how much time would you spend with a student on post things like posture, turnout, their layback? How much time did you spend on that? Well, I spend a lot. You know, it's amazing the senior ladies that take a position with the, the free leg behind and the toe turned in. And it's a, it's a basic position that, you know, a juvenile should be taught. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much afraid that coaching is not going in that direction very much now, that uh, the way we're situated is that um, if, you, uh, if you can't... Uh, do extremely advanced jumping. You're not in the business anymore. And um, I think I think at some point, somebody, some wonderful skater will come out and combine the two very well. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Mm. I always think that 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 the mark should be should be equally given for uh, emotional skating and artistic skating and the content of the difficult jumping and spinning should be equal. I and it's agree. not. I would agree because you know people respond when they see Jason Brown skate at the nationals as much as when they see a quad. You know they they appreciate when they see something really spectacular. Like that. Yeah, um, and I'm glad to see with him certainly in the national level. I think the judges are starting to appreciate that, um, and I hope they'll do so at the world level. A real good example of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, one skater that really did combine it was Peggy Fleming. So how did you, you know, become acquainted with Peggy and teach her? I taught her just for one year, her junior year. Mm -hmm. And um, just, she was a, a natural skater. Uh, a, a, a beautiful girl came to be a beautiful lady. And it wasn't just with her skating, the way she handled herself and projected herself. And the fact that she was the, she was the skater that after the terrible happenings in 61, I think it was within seven, eight years, she put America back on the map, you know, and won the uh, Olympic title. And uh, so she, she was a very, very important uh, young lady for American skating, extremely important. Well, you mentioned Shinozo <laughs> Starbuck and Ken Shelley and your work with them. And they were really your first top pair team. So what did you learn as the process of coaching them, you know, as a novice coach at that time? Well, I learned how to try and, uh, and enable a pair that were not 6'2 and, and 4'11 uh, to be successful. Because uh, pairs of a similar height have advantages and disadvantages, and they must 
they must learn how to project the advantages uh, to their best. Um, and uh, and I, I, I think I think they did it. And of course, mm -hmm. Ty and Randy were the same. They didn't have a vast difference in height and they managed to be very successful too. Now, Joe and Ken were so close to the podium at the Olympics. Was that fourth place finish something that bothered you? Well, which pair was that? Jojo Starbuck and yes. Ken Shepard. Yeah, they, I think they came fourth in the Olympics and third at Worlds. Um, uh, I wasn't very disappointed because they always, again, were, I think, the crowd favorite. They were always very, very popular. And of course, that popularity with the public uh, helped them very much to transfer a professional career. And they had a, a great career uh, with ice capades. And um, <clears throat> looking back, uh, probably wouldn't have made much difference whether they were fourth or third as to the rest of their life, the rest of their skating career. Well, you also yeah. mentioned Ty and Randy. So I'm wondering, what do you remember about working with Ty and Randy? Uh, well, a lot of things. Um, they just were very special. I don't think there's been a pair like them before or after. And of course, I think they were the ones at that time that did compare athleticism and artistry very well. They were even in those days, uh, hitting a throw triple cell, a throw double axle, um, and yet they were very, very artistic. And I think programs were wonderful. And um, they had a lot of work with their programs with a uh, lady by the name of Terry Rudol, who was a ballet teacher and uh, spent a lot of time in ballet. And I think that helped them enormously. So you mentioned not remembering your world title that much as a skater, but obviously coaching uh, a pair to a world title has to be a different experience. How gratifying was that for you? Well, you know, because a lot of it's a question of age. You know, when I won the world title, I was 22, 23, didn't know much about anything and um, didn't really understand uh, perhaps the importance of it because it was important for me for future to be a world champion. But um, it's, it's, I think a body of work, you know, is, as a skater, it was perhaps 10 years. As a coach, it's been since 19, I don't know, 50 something. It's been 60, 70 years. And so that seems to overcome everything I did as a, as a, as a skater. Well, Irina Renina uh, was out of competition in 1979. As a coach, did you feel like this was their window, that it was now or never, and that they needed to capitalize on it? Yes, you know, the Russian pairs in those years had been very dominant. And again, usually with, uh, you know, the very tall man skater and the small petite lady, and I knew it was gonna be a battle, but, uh, you know, the next year was the Olympics and unfortunately, we had a problem there. I, I, I really regret that there wasn't the competition between the top American world champion mm -hmm. and the top Russian ex-world champion. And it uh, would have been a wonderful competition. And I don't know who would have won. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ty spoke to us about how you would train them. She said that you would have them do a run through, put on their sneakers, run around the parking lot, put their skates back on and then do another program. So what kind of tactics would you use to make sure that they were peaked for 1979 and 1980? Well, um, I think she's overdoing that a little. Uh, I, I don't remember that at all. Um, <laughs> but I do remember a strong run through. Um, I, never, I never, after the run through, wanted more skating because they were tired and it's so well known that when you're tired, you're more injury prone. So I think uh, she was right in that I had them uh, take off their skates and do some running shoes and do some running. That's true, but uh, two programs and a lot of running, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> 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 oh, but 
Ty, Ty has a vivid imagination. She's a wonderful, entertaining young lady. And uh, in the years I spent with them, uh, really remarkable and uh, very happy. <laughs> well, leading up to the late Placid Olympics, Ty and Randy had a bit of a rocky skate at nationals. How were they skating prior to Randy's injury and how confident were you heading into the Olympics about their performances? Well, um, Randy uh, had this injury uh, way before Ty knew about it. Uh, Randy and I talked about it and he was uh, having treatment, but she didn't understand at all the severity of it. And so of course, uh, training was very restricted and uh, very difficult. And um, the times at Lake Placid when they had to withdraw were sort of so sad and uh, it was very difficult for everybody. Well, given the <laughs> war and you know the judging situation at the time with block judging and the Soviet blocks, do you feel it would have been possible to beat them uh, in Lake Placid? Well, as I said, I don't know. They were coming in as, uh, as the world champions. They had impressed the uh, international judging com community with a different style and a different way of doing things. And as usually in those days, it might have depended on the composition of the panel, whether the, uh, whether the Russians uh, had a lot of uh, whole Hungarians and Bulgarians and Kaki Stanis or, or whether uh, we'd had uh, UK and French and Canadian and US judges on the panel. That would probably have decided it, not the, uh, not the way the skating went. So you've always- the, 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 un, the unpleasant truth. Well, you have been described as a brilliant strategist. And one of the articles I came across was saying that you were watching the 1980 Europeans and noticed that Rodnina and Zaitsev had three illegal moves in their uh, free skate, that perhaps uh, he was, uh, Zaitsev was holding Rodnina's leg in some of the lifts, and that you waited until the precise moment to alert the press before the competition. And you were quoted as saying, I didn't come here to go on the defensive. So what do you remember about that situation? Well, you know, the rules there were different and there were restrictions on the hold that could happen in pair skating and, and not three, but uh, one of the lifts certainly was illegal. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I didn't draw attention to it and make everybody aware of it, that the judging panel would probably ignore it. And so I made up a little letter illustrating this problem and uh, circulated it to the appropriate people. And again, we'll never know whether that would have made any difference or not. Well, you mentioned Randy's injury. Um, you know, when did you actually first learn of Randy's injury and how did you manage their, their training? Well, it was very difficult because, you know, I'm obviously not a medical man and uh, I had to go by the, uh, the, the medical uh, recommendations where trading was, uh, was reduced. And, and what happened at Olympics, I don't know if you know, was that he, the day before, he really had a lot of pain and really couldn't skate very well. And the uh, Olympic uh, doctor gave him an injection. I think it was Novocaine in that, uh, in that hip area. And, uh, and what happened was that he, he didn't suffer any pain, but he didn't have any feeling either. And, and so in the warm up, it was obvious that he couldn't compete. And the smartest thing I ever did as a coach, I think, was, was going into the uh, Olympic uh, press conference after the pairs and uh, insisting that the uh, doctor came with me so that he could answer all the medical issues on there. But it might have been that, that really, and he might have, he probably should have tried that certain injection before. 24 hours before a competition and to see how the reaction was. And that didn't happen. You also mentioned, also mentioned 
that Ty didn't know that Randy was injured. So talk me through the thought process behind that. Was that to shield her from any, you know, getting caught in worry or what was I thinking behind not telling Ty? Well, she, well, Ty and Randy were very close. And Ty is a very caring person. And uh, actually, Randy was the one that asked me not to tell her that he didn't want to upset her in any way. And he, right to the end, thought right, on, right up until the, the warm-up for Olympics, he thought he could, could compete. And uh, so he was the one. And, uh, of course, she was devastated. But, you know, again, things turned out as you know, as well as they could be. I can remember uh, in the 48 hours after that Olympics, I think they got over 2,000 uh, pieces of mail and letters and presents in support. And then, of course, they also went on to a very uh, successful professional career. Uh, um, so there were a lot of pluses in there too. But, uh, of course, looking back, it's probably, probably the most uh, disappointing, disappointing uh, competition there. Uh, mm -hmm. Together with Sasha's Cohen's fourth place at Olympics, mm -hmm. where I thought she could have been, uh, should have been much better. Mm -hmm. when, when you say that you were disappointed <laughs> with Sasha, do you, in, do you mean um, in terms of how the, she was judged or in terms of you know, what you could have achieved together on the ice? No, what she could have achieved. I mean, it was remarkable because I think it was almost, these were Olympics in 2002 in, in Salt Lake City. It was uh, after the horrendous bombing in New York and there was a lot of uh, tension uh, at that competition. And uh, she was, I don't know, 15, 16, came in and uh, I think was third in the short program, which nobody ever expected to. And of course, had a, uh, I think had a shot, certainly a good shot, the medal at those Olympics. And uh, of course, long program didn't happen quite as we all wanted. Well, you're someone who always appears very calm at competitions. So go in Lake Placid and at that time, how stressed were you, you know, with everything that was going on and, you know, they're supposed to win and he's injured, you know, how did you manage your own, you know, nerves? Well, I had in interior turmoil. Uh, things were going around, didn't know exactly what to do and had to make a decision at the Olympics whether to pull a competitor, competitive pair out on the warm-up, which I don't think has been done before. I can't remember it. And uh, so, of course, I was extremely worried about making um, a mistake and the wrong decision. But directly I saw in the warm-up not only was he not rotating and jumping, but that he almost dropped a uh, tie from an overhead lift. Was very lucky not to fall with injury. It was when that happened that, that I thought, well, we're not gonna risk uh, either of them, particularly Ty coming down from a lift and decided to withdraw them. And I got, got, got criticized a little afterwards for it. How had they been skating? You know, you mentioned that Randy had had pain. You know, were they able to practice at those Olympics or, you know, what was that? They, they had been practicing pretty well. They had been practicing nearly as much. The training had been almost halved after two thirds. So they didn't have the amount of training. And so protecting him in that way, they were able to do pretty well. Um, well enough that I thought they still had a shot. Well, another one of your former skiers whom we interviewed with Tiffany Chin, and she spoke about how involved her mother, Marjorie, was in her career. <laughs> so I'm wondering, how did you manage Marjorie and how do you manage an overbearing skating mother? Well, I'm not, you know, I, a lot of coaches um, really don't want anything to do with parents and want to eliminate the parents and the uh, I've never thought that way. I thought, particularly with younger skaters, particularly with young ladies from six to 15 or 14 that are interested in supporting parent is very important. In fact, I don't think they can be competitively successful without one. The difficulty of course comes 
in those formative years, 14, 15, 16, when they become less uh, dependent on parents and coaches <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, begin to make their own way in life. And so Mrs. Chin and I had a variety of really deep uh, conversations yeah. about these sort of issues. Well, Tiffany did achieve some of her best performances under you. There are videos of her landing triple axles. She was landing the triple flip in 1984. Many people felt um, you know, that she should have meddled at those Olympics. So what I was wondering is you described yourself as not a very good jumper. So how much did you have to study jump technique to be able to work with skaters? When, to when the, what, I'm, what I said, when the American skaters came to Europe and were wonderful in jumping, uh, instead of practicing uh, as I should be, I was watching them half the time. And so I gathered that not only, not only the technique in jumping, but the coaching techniques, the attitude the coaches had towards the American skaters was extremely different from what I was used to in the UK. And so I brought all those things uh, to, to, to my coaching. I learned, from, I learned from Americans. How is the attitude different? What do you mean by that? Confidence. Uh, in, in England, um, and, and in England, of course, I, I spent the first 20, 23 years of my life and uh, was very fortunate with that. But the, one of the things I was taught in England was how to be a good loser, how you lose well, how you lose uh, behaving correctly. It seemed to be sometimes more important than winning, how to lose well. Uh, I wish I'd been taught how to win well. Well, many people felt that Tiffany Chin could have gone on to become a world champion after those Olympics in Sarajevo. What do you think held her back, you know, going into 1985 and beyond? Well, I had a lot of deep conversations with her mother about that. Well, I also saw that there was a lot of um, media articles at the time about Tiffany being the first Asian American. You coached Bobby Beauchamp, who they were saying was the first, one of the first African American skaters to represent the US internationally. Do you think all of that talk about having to represent your entire race was a lot of pressure for young skaters to handle? Oh, I think so. I think particularly with black skaters, maybe more than Oriental, uh, I taught uh, many of the young uh, black skaters, um, Richard Yule um, and others, uh, and um, it was it was difficult times for them. And uh, I'm so pleased to see that along those lines things have changed and and are changing and, and will change even more. I think they're going to have uh, a much easier time in the future uh, because of. Uh, because of those early young black skaters. Well, in 1989 to 1990, you coached Christian Maguchi and Rudy Galindo, and they skated pairs together. How aware were you that Christy was going to end ultimately on that partnership and focus on her singles career? And is that something that you thought she should have done earlier in her career? Well, um... Uh, yeah, they, of course, they were a very good pair. They were a very good pair because of their individual skating ability. But I think it, and now you may correct me, but I think it was when she decided to concentrate solo was when uh, she won the, the world title. I think it was about that time. So, you know, that's a fact. And uh, uh, these days, uh, you know, you have you have to be specific in training, and uh, uh, you know, as as we've seen ever since uh, Ken Shelley did that, I don't think anybody else has has, has won a major title in pairs and solos. Um, I, it was obvious, I think, that she benefited in herself in stopping the pairs. Well, one of your teams at that time was Cheeky and Hot Sand. And you mentioned Todd as being someone that, you know, you've been friendly with for decades. So how did you actually become acquainted with Todd? 
Uh, you're asking me all these questions about 50, 60 years ago, uh, and I'm doing my best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I don't really remember. I remember him as a solo skater. As a solo skater, he was taught by Frank Carroll. And um, uh, then he wanted to get into pairs. I think he skated for Denmark. He didn't skate the United States. As a soloist, he skated for Denmark. And so he came back and uh, we put them uh, together. And uh, again, they had pretty quick success. So I was very pleased, of course, uh, the whole thing with the pairs um, revolved about the, I think it was the Olympics or World Championship where they and uh, and the other pair, uh, Jenny Mino, Scott Wendland mm -hmm. were skating together. And of course, mm -hmm. I went into those Olympics, I think it was Olympics or World Championship with two pairs and came out with one. <laughs> and, and, um, but, uh, you know, I think, the, change was good and uh, I think uh, Todd and Jenny really through the years uh, projected uh, a great pair in many many ways both on and off the ice I was, I was very proud of them all of them. Interesting that you mentioned <laughs> Natasha, uh, which by Frank I didn't know that. Uh, Natasha was very young at the time and she how was she able to compete at those senior worlds and what do you think about age limits in general in the sport? I, um, you know, I was teaching, I think it was Sasha I was teaching when she, uh, she did well at US Nationals and should have qualified for Worlds and, and they didn't let her go. I said at that time, I think it was, uh, it was age discrimination. I don't, I don't really see the reason for it at all. Uh, do you know the reason? I, I don't know. I see junior skaters doing quads. So I, I don't think that it really prevents maybe what the intention is to prevent. You know, I think it was supposed to protect skaters, but we see so many junior skaters doing quad toes, quad sow cows, quad yeah. lutzes. Yeah. I don't think. You yeah. can't, uh, can't stop progress like that. You can try, but you, uh, you, can never, you can never stop it. But of course, Sasha Kuchiki, had an advantage. She came from a skating family. I mean, both her mother and father were in uh, ice capades. Um, he did a wonderful fire act as a very good skater. I think from a very early age, uh, uh, she was into skating. So although she was 11, 12 years old, she uh, was many years older than that in experience. Will you coach Christopher Bowman during the 1992 Olympic season following wondered, a series wondered, of coaching? I wondered, changes. wondered, wondered when you were going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> were you at all, Mr. Nix, were you at all reluctant to take him on given his history of coaches? And how did you focus him during that Olympic season? No, I enjoyed him. Uh, I mean, it was wonderful. I mean, the exciting and everything was happening and it was never a dull moment and all the other kids sort of liked to have him around. And of course he was, as Frank would tell you, I mean, he couldn't really, didn't really train. He never trained at all. He uh, just was uh, fortunate enough to be a wonderful pressure skater that when you put him in there in competition, you saw a different person than you saw during the week in training. But, but uh, I was only with him, I think for a year and, um, that year went uh, went like lightning. I mean, he was uh, he was great fun. I enjoyed it. Great challenge, um, but you know, by and large, uh, he did he did pretty much what I asked him to. He uh, he was okay in that way. Very respectful guy. Um, a little different from his uh, public image at all times. Yeah, in Chris Brennan's book, Inside Ed, Christopher shared that he had almost a thousand dollar a day cocaine habit during his eligible career. How aware were you of what was happening in his life off the ice at that time? Well, uh, I knew his reputation. He came down uh, to me from Canada with Tyler Cranston. And um, I knew of this issue and I, I, I knew it was an issue. Um, so from the time that he came, 
he and the other world skaters I was teaching, I think both the pairs um, uh, had regular uh, drug testing uh, in a body. Uh, I had to do that to protect myself. And during the time with me, um, he never failed one of those drug tests. So uh, uh, Christopher also uh, had a vivid imagination. And um, although I'm sure uh, that, that that was a problem with him, it certainly wasn't with him when he trained with me because I had regular testing done, which is uh, very unusual in those days. I did it, honestly, not so much for him, but to protect uh, myself. Well, you mentioned coaching a lot of Frank Carroll skaters. And I'm just wondering today, you know, when someone changes coaches in Russia, it makes national news there. It's, you know, a big drama. How are you and Frank both able to, you know, work well in California and have so many skaters and parents probably going back and forth between the two? When I was, um, when I was at uh, the PSA convention, I think it was two years ago, Frank and I had a question and answer um, in front of a large audience. And um, that question was given to me by the moderator. And I said, well, you're very wrong, sir, because at the beginning, I, uh, I didn't like the guy at all. I mean, um, I had started teaching in California and had some success. I was been there three or four years. And, and uh, a lot of the young skaters that I and the, my associate coaches trained used to go around for these weekly club competitions. We have a number of those in, in Southern California. And there were six or eight, were pretty good young kids, you know, juvenile and novice, and they were winning everything. And they used to come back and tell me, oh, we'd won this and we'd won that. And then the next year came and they came back and I asked, the, I didn't used to go with them, other coaches usually did. I, and they were coming back and they weren't winning anymore. And I said, what's happening? Well, they said, there's this guy from Boston and his kids are pretty good and he's managing to beat us. I said, well, you know, hope he goes back to Boston soon. <laughs> uh, but over the years, um, I watched him and uh, I saw the image he projected, which was very professional. He was very businesslike. He worked very hard. So I became uh, respectful of him. I respected his work. And uh, over the last few years, um, I've uh, come to like the guy a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about you being a strategist and you achieved great success with Jenny Mino and Todd Sand. And at the time, the commentators would often uh, complained that maybe they didn't have as hard of side-by-side -side jumps, but they would always skate clean. They'd skate that beautiful Nessun Dorma program and the judges would give them the marks and they would wind up either winning at the nationals or you know, winning a world medal. So I was wondering, what is your strategy with knowing when to go for the clean program and when to add in harder elements? Um, I, I have a philosophy on what I call percentage completions. That means in training, if you have a double axle and you try 10 and you do eight, you have an 80% uh, completion. Um, usually I never put in a program more than one risk item, I call it. I always feel that um, uh, if you can make, you may make one mistake, but if you come back very strongly and have a clean program, you can still get a pretty good mark. And Todd and Jenny um, were very high in risk element percentages. I mean, they would be 95, 100% in all of the moves and there'd only be perhaps one, that's what I call a risk item. And often, of course, that was a risk, it, it also could be accomplished. So uh, they only had one thing to worry about really. The rest of the time uh, was enjoyment because they, were confident and they knew they could do it and they did it. Well, in a 2002 interview, you described Sasha Cohen as tempestuous, flirtatious, challenging, and beautiful. So I'm wondering what were your first impressions of Sasha when you started to work with her? 
First impressions? Yes. Well, um, as I've said before, I, I never met Sasha at the uh, uh, um, Costa Mesa ring where I was at. I encountered her. Um, I was teaching and, and, I was, and she was a little girl. I think, you know, she was very small, about eight or nine years old. And I was standing and all of a sudden she skated and I was standing with my legs apart and she came right through my legs underneath me. And uh, I nearly fell over and I turned around and I said, you know, who the hell is that? And, uh, and somebody said, oh, well, that's Sasha. That's, that's what Sasha is. So, and I wasn't teaching her then at all. I was teaching somebody else. And, uh, and so, again, Sasha was always a challenge, but, but wonderful years I had with her. I still uh, am in contact with her. Whenever she's out here in California, we always have coffee together. Um, uh, she was great. She was great for my career and uh, uh, just just a, a wonderful skater. Again, um, you know, looking back, probably should have won more than she did. Uh, but I think that was half of her excitement. You never quite knew what was going to happen. What you did know was that if she skated well, uh, she was very difficult to beat. Well, she was undeniably one of the most talented skaters in the sport. And I remember competing against her at Junior Worlds in 2000. And I remember watching a practice session and our required flying spin in the short program was a flying sit. And during her run through, Sasha did a flying camel. And I remember she skated over to you and you were understandably saying that was the wrong spin and you had her do the flying sit a couple times after. And I remember thinking, how could someone do that? Just do the wrong spin? So I'm wondering, how did you manage her focus? Because getting to know Sasha, she is somebody who sometimes you just wanna say focus a little bit. So how did you manage that with her? Well, one thing I learned as a coach, you know, the first few years I made so many mistakes. I, I tried to um, make every skater skate the John Nick's way and only one way. And then I began to realize that didn't work for everybody. And so Sasha was, uh, of course, a challenge. But um, the, the, the enjoyment that I had with her, um, with the pluses and minus, the ups and downs, uh, uh, the excitement, the disappointments, um, the feeling of success and failure. I mean, I think you have to fail, you know, a few times to really enjoy success. Uh, know the difference and uh, she certainly uh, brought that uh, to herself and, and to me as well. Uh, 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 really a, a, remarkable, a remarkable skater. I haven't seen anybody uh, like her since. Well, and she was portrayed, portrayed by the media as a very headstrong young woman who knew what she wanted and at times seemed like she would test the limits a bit and could be borderline disrespectful. And we saw you play into this a bit at 2002 press conference at Nationals where I think a reporter asked Sasha if she was going to try the quad at the Olympics and she gave her answer and then kind of turned the microphone to you and you said, oh, well, <laughs> you made the decision and kind of wagged your finger at her. So I'm wondering, how much did you know how the media was portraying her and how much did you play into that role of how they saw her? Well, um, I began to notice, you know, when I was at uh, major competitions um, with press conferences afterwards that they were usually pretty boring. You know, it was, um, you skated well or you didn't skate well or it's a nice dress and what do you think of the judges? I mean, we could know the question and answers. So I thought it would be nice to introduce some uh, sort of reality uh, and, and difference and a little more interest to, uh, to these press conferences. And uh, um, Sasha didn't like it all the time, uh, but you know, it was a time that I thought I got a little of my own back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how consistent was Sasha's quad? Was she just overly excited and ambitious? I mean, how realistic was it? I know that she landed it. Um... Oh, it was never, it was never realistic. Um, 
she landed perhaps two or three in the four weeks prior to competition. And then we're talking about completion percentage, probably was about, you know, five or 6%. So it was uh, never, however, um, I encouraged her to try it. I think again, it was a, uh, a news item and it uh, created some more interest in her and, and emphasized the, the difficulty that uh, she was aiming for. And uh, always, uh, you know, she took, she's a very courageous young skater because her style of skating, she often took uh, very horrendous falls and hurtful falls and uh, never seemed to be affected, always got up and went on. And it was one of the other attributes I always admired in her. Well, during her career, the media focused so much on her inability to deliver uh, two clean programs. Yes. And I'm wondering why you thought that was, you know, Ty and Randy talked about, you know, the way of your training to really instill consistency in them. And, you know, Jenny and Todd were always very consistent. So what do you think um, held Sasha back in that area? Well, if I had known, I would have fixed it. <laughs> Did you use the same training strategy? Was she doing full programs, you know, every day? Was she consistent in practice? She was doing... Uh, programs, obviously it was a mental issue. There's something mentally uh, would, would happen there. And again, you're right, you know, a wonderful short program as in um, the Olympics in Torino, uh, translated into not such a wonderful program in the free, or it could be reversed. It could be a, a pretty bad short followed by a wonderful freestyle. But why that happened, um, I have uh, no idea. Uh, you know, tried to work with it for many years and probably write it down to one of my many failures as a coach. Well, the two of you were very successful in developing so many unique moves. I remember one year, um, and it seems like you really know how to market skaters. And one year, Sasha came out for the Grand Prix, I think, uh, after those nationals where she did well and she had the Sasha skid and the Sasha spiral and the Sasha curl. And there were so many unique things that were really branded to her. And I read that you said that she really didn't take ballet, that she just had a natural feeling per position. Is that true? And what do you credit, you know, all of the extension and, and the quality of her? Well, well, two things. Firstly, um, I don't think she ever took any ballet. She's just naturally so elegant, could not take literally could not take an ugly position, couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, and as regards the elements, that's what I learned from Mr. Lucy and Dick Button, that every year we tried to come out uh, with something a little different, a new move, because, you know, the, one of the criticisms of uh, top skaters is, um, you know, they do the same things, they all look the same. And we always tried to come out and, uh, have something different. And of course, Sasha was always uh, very enthusiastic to try new things and difficult things and things that nobody else did. And uh, so uh, we worked uh, pretty well together along those lines. <laughs> well, Sasha's given a number of interviews about perfectionism. And the, at the time, the media would ask her really tough questions. You know, they really covered her with a lot of expectations. And I was wondering, do you think that that media focus from people became almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy? There was a gymnast at the time who would have difficulty on one of the apparatus and the media focused so much on that apparatus that it became from a problem this big to you know, this gigantic problem. So I was wondering you know, what your thoughts on that impact was. Well, yeah, it, it, it's worrying. It's worrying for any skater or any competitor that, that has a weakness and they all do that, uh, you know, gets known to the news media, to the judging community, the skate community, that weakness is out there. And, and you know, everybody often uh, focuses on it. And the more they focus on it, the more difficult the weakness uh, becomes. And, um, but I'm not sure that applied to Sasha. Sasha didn't listen hardly to anybody. <laughs> uh, when I used to talk to her about this, this is happening there, she, she, drew a blank. She was only interested in what she was doing and doing it well and doing new things and doing interesting things and doing graceful things. And uh, that was her world and uh, didn't seem to worry her, but it, 
it, it is worrying for the average competitor, really worrying. Well, another skater who had a lot of success under you was Naomi Narinam, and she had unexpected success the 1999 Nationals, finishing second. And then the following year, Sasha won the short program at Nationals and won silver medal at Nationals. And that same competition, Naomi was having arguably the lowest point in her career at that, at that uh, competition. So I'm wondering, how as a coach do you manage two young women, one of whom is having the highest point of their career and the other of whom is having arguably the lowest point of her career? Well, the first thing an experienced coach thinks is that he is sooner or later, he has two outstanding competitors in the same division. Sooner or later, one of them will leave him or her. And so he has to decide who's going and who's staying. And... Um, uh, it was very difficult because Naomi had, had a very good year. She was a very courageous young lady. I can remember at the Nationals you were talking about in the short program, she was hitting a triple flip and uh, uh, she fell and it wasn't ordinary fall. She, she hit her head sharply. People thought she had concussion. Uh, we were doubtful whether she was going to do the long program. And uh, 24, 48 hours after that, tremendous fall, she came back and, and gave a, a wonderful long program, including the triple flip that she had crashed in before. So she was a very courageous uh, young lady. And, um, but Sasha was too, and there was competition between the two, which was normal. And uh, uh, it was not, a, it was not, in answer to your question, it was not easy as a coach. You had to be very, very, very careful uh, to treat both the same. And uh, I tried to do that best of my ability. Well, at that championship, there was a famous fluff piece about Sasha and Naomi. And it, the storyline was starting to build a rivalry between the two of them. How much did you try to shelter them from that storyline? Or was that something that you thought could motivate them? No, I didn't sponsor any rivalry at all. You know, they had a natural rivalry. Um, I, I didn't have to encourage it. Um, and I tried to be uh, strictly, strictly neutral. And if you talk to both girls and their families, I, I, I think they'll endorse that opinion. Well, the media at that time really jumped on the notion of Sasha being brash, like Jenny mentioned. And there was a controversy that journalists thought that she intentionally tried to get into Michelle Kwan's way. And I remember Bob Costas asked her about it on TV and Michelle, you know, made a comment that her boyfriend at the time was a hockey player and that, you know, he taught her how to check Sasha if she got in her way again. You know, how much of that do you think was real? And how much of that do you think was exaggerated by journalists kind of looking to hype a story? It was all absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, was it in Salt Lake City? Yep. Yeah. Um, there were only about three girls on the ice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, you, you couldn't possibly deliberately get in somebody's way. It had been very obvious. And, and um, besides, uh, even if she had been in the way, unintentionally. Good skaters just go around people. I always uh, talk to my skaters and tell them, don't look for people to be in the way. Look for spaces to do things. Don't look for people, look for spaces. And good skaters, mm -hmm. when they look for spaces, can get almost anything. Well, you mentioned students Gosh. leaving you. And in 2002, Sasha went to get programs by Tatiana Tarasova and wound up switching to her as a coach. So how surprised were you and how disappointing was that as a, as a coach? Uh, surprised and disappointed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, she did. However, however, um, the parting was uh, pleasant, was not unpleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of skaters have left me. And um, I always hope 
that they leave me and at some time they come back. And many of them do. Some don't, but many do. And uh, of course, that was the case uh, with uh, Miss Curry. Yeah, my next question is, when she came back to you, you know, she had really been through it. You know, she had had two splits with Tatiana Tarasova and Robin Wagner. And Robin was, you know, very upset and talking about it in the press. And I know that her parents had had a difficult time and she had been injured and at a competition and you had like only a couple of weeks to get her ready for the nationals. So how did you go, you know, restoring confidence in someone who had really had a very difficult time? Well, you know, obviously because I knew, well, most people knew that the talent must be still there. There mm -hmm. must be other problems that have uh, caused this, uh, this, this lowering in, in a, you know, performance. So what I did, only did really, for those few weeks was to restore some confidence uh, with her in many, many uh, different ways, both psychologically and, uh, and on the ice uh, physically. And um, directly she got in the correct frame of mind, then the uh, old ability uh, came through and uh, um, didn't take a long time with her. I'm not aware of what the problems were. She never talked to me about them, but um, mm -hmm. it was obvious that she was lacking a lot of confidence. And uh, unfortunately we were able to put that right. Well, after she won the national title in 2006, there was such a focus on whether she was going to deliver at the Olympics. And the media was focused on her skipping a practice at the Olympics because of a groin injury. So how concerned about her injury were you? And did you think that she was gonna be able to deliver? I don't remember the injury being very serious. I can't remember that. Um, but um, I mean, she was in very good shape for going to it because no, she had no problem at all. So I think that injury was probably uh, magnified in the press um, which uh, often happens. <laughs> no, I actually consider her Olympic performance one of her most memorable for her free skate. And because after the first two jumping passes, I thought that she skated with more motion and more freedom than we ever saw from Sasha in her entire career. You know, she really gave a tremendous performance. You know, what was that experience like for you as a coach? You're watching your student, they miss their first elements. It has to be a little bit of a nightmare. And then you know, she really stabilized. Well, with Sasha, Sasha never looked back. I mean, she was always looking forward. Um, she probably, she probably put it out of her mind uh, completely. Now, a normal uh, competitor wouldn't do that. They miss the first or second elements. Usually, uh, things go south rapidly, um, but uh, not so with her. And I think it's part of her character that she came back. Uh, uh, so strongly. I mean, basically, she saved a silver medal. I mean, normally you would expect uh, somebody with uh, that sort of start to probably finish up uh, fifth or sixth, but of course that that uh, that didn't happen. So, although she made those mistakes, it was it was uh, in the end one of her better days, I think. Although expensive for her, in, in a way for the position she finished because obviously. Uh, Again, biasly, but obviously she was the uh, best skater at that competition, no doubt about it. I agree. Okay. Well, well you, a couple of years later, you helped Kiana McLaughlin and Rockney Brubaker. And at that time, they had a lot of media attention before they had a lot of international success. Do you think that too much attention too soon is something that's you know a problem in skating? Yes, I, I probably is. Um, you know, sometimes the uh, slow and steady approach is, uh, is the better one. But again, you can't uh, generalize. I mean, everybody's different. Uh, you know, some competitors uh, reach uh, the peak of their ability very quickly and, and uh, ability go goes very quickly too. So every, everybody's, uh, everybody's different in those ways. Uh, in, a, in a way, of course, uh, it was a disappointing pair for me. I'd, again, probably not a very good 
coaching job because uh, they had uh, wonderful ability, just uh, I think a pretty bad competition at nationals. Hmm. Well, you're known for not allowing your skaters to have agents. Why is that? Not allowing skaters to have? To have agents. Agents. Well, um, you know, the top skaters have, uh, you know, business opportunities. I mean, the sort of business opportunities they have professionally um, in shows on television, endorsements. I don't see how they can handle that without an agent. Um, agents are criticized a lot, sometimes with good reason. Um, but I don't think you can stop anybody having somebody that's going to help them in their career. Doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense at all. Well, I as, long as, the, as long as the, the coach and competitor and agent have the correct relationship, I call it a triangle there that everybody knows their job, uh, doesn't step on the other person as long as that's uh, laid out and, and adhered to, uh, I think an agent uh, is important and has to be there. Well, you mentioned being involved in the skates on the business side. So how did that come about? I think Sandra Bezik actually told me that you hired her to choreograph for the ice capades. Yeah, well, I I had some wonderful years of ice capades and they were very, very good to me. Um, uh, I headed up, I think we had 15 ice rinks and 220 teachers. And um, uh, I got involved with a lot of uh, different people involved with the uh, capades and the shows. And um, uh, Sandra, I'd always known as a great skater, as a pair skater uh, from Canada and a choreographer. And, um, you know, it was those times that we as coaches who used to do our own choreography mostly started to understand. And, and, and Frank and I have talked about this, that, that we finally understood that um, we did not have the complete knowledge um, uh, to choreograph a program. Although we should still be responsible for the program, we should be responsible for the outcome of the program, that uh, assistance from a, a, a good choreographer is really essential, certainly the last few years. Well, one recent quest woman that you coached was Ashley Wagner before your retirement in 2014. What do you remember about coaching Ashley? What were your impressions of her as a student? Uh, supreme independence. Um, when she came to me, of course, she was an established skater. I think she was late teens. And uh, she came out to the uh, rink I coached at, Eliso Vieira in California, um, and moved into an apartment, got herself a job, um, worked pretty hard and then trained hard. So it was her independence impressed me because usually uh, young ladies at that age, you know, as I've said, had a lot of support, parents, friends, helpers, uh, but she was by herself and uh, trained extraordinarily well. Um, good, good times with Ashley. I think she was pleased that after a few years at Nationals when she'd just missed the boat many times that she uh, was able to succeed with me and I was proud of that and, and she was very happy with it. She was, uh, she was a happy girl, very popular with the skaters, very independent, I admired her for that. How did you manage to get her to the Nationals? Well, um, Really, with her, it was programming. It was uh, it was hard work, um, holding herself responsible, uh, dealing in facts, uh, talking about facts, not opinions. On my behalf, of, of measuring a double axle of ten feet and saying, you know, in, in a month it needs to be eleven or twelve feet. Uh, talking about 
uh, rotation in spins, uh, revolutions per minute, which you can do with uh, aid of the video, uh, dealing in facts so that she could see that she was improving, dealing with completion percentages, what I talked about, so that she knows her complete completion percentage was improving and therefore being more confident competition. Uh, dealing in fact with Ashley and she appreciated that. She always wanted that. She didn't want opinions. She wanted the facts of, about what she had to do. Well, so many skaters live, or so many coaches and skaters live for the Olympics, but particularly with coaches, that's the pinnacle of their career. So I'm wondering what was behind your decision to retire in 2014, right before the start of the Olympic season? Of who retiring? Are you retiring as Me? a coach in 2014? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I think I was uh, 85 years old. You want me to keep working? I mean, what do you want me? To, what do you want me to do? <laughs> How long are you going to work? Right. Not. When I'm 85, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to enjoy myself a little more. And really, the, there was a tipping point. Uh, in, so in Sochi, they had a uh, competition like they always do a few months before Olympics. It was sort of get ready for it. And I can remember, uh, I can remember getting in a plane, going to, going to New York, five, six hours, three or four layover getting in eight, nine hours, going to Anchor, I think it was, uh, waiting 10 hours in the uh, room there to get a small plane to sushi, arriving in sushi, um, getting onto a bus, uh, getting into the hotel at, um, you know, I think about four o'clock in the morning and I had a, a practice with Ashley, I think it was at 7.30 and, uh, after that practice, I said, well, um, that's about it, Mr. Nix. <laughs> <laughs> you reached your limit, yes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed in Ashley's skating when she started working with you was the change to her second mark. She just seemed to get more refined. Her posture was better, you know, toe point, turn up, all of that. So I'm wondering, do you have your skaters do ballet off the ice? Or is this just a, a testament to your work with someone like Ashley on the ice? I think it all depends. Some need ballet, some don't. Uh, Sasha obviously didn't. Uh, I can't recall Ashley working ballet. I think she worked in Pilates, but she, Ashley was not a balletic skater. Ashley mm -hmm. was an entertaining skater. Again, mm -hmm. uh, she understood audiences. Um, uh, she projected a lot of athleticism, a lot of feminism. Um, she projected her personality very well and uh, um, was a different, a different sort of skater, but mostly she became a confident skater. As I've said before, that was the difference with her. And her confidence allowed her to interact with an audience, to project herself to the judges because she was confident in what she was doing. Well, you mentioned her spins and using percentages. I remember when she was with Raphael, she didn't always like to practice her spins in the program. That was something we used to kind of chide her about. But how much attention do you pay to spins? Because your skaters have always had very, very good spins. So you were talking about clocking the rotations. Is that something that you do regularly with your skaters? Well, yes, I used to. Um, you know, uh, judge usually looks for five positions. You want me to go all this te technicality? Judge usually looks for five things in spinning. They look for correct position. Uh, they look for number of rotations. They look for speed of rotation. They look for control of the exit. And they look for the centralization of spins. Those are the five things to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I, but the other side of the question is that with the ice capes or any shows with the general public, you'll often get much more applause in a fast scratch spin than ever you do in a triple toe loop if you look at that non-skating audience. So I always thought it was important, not only from, from a 
competitive point of view, but from an audience point of view, that spins were excellent. And and you 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 do not have to be a good figure skater to spin well. You have mm -hmm. to be very flexible. You have to have a strong core, and you have to practice the hell out of it. You don't have to be a good skater. Those are the things you have to do. Well, we did see you on the ice today, and I know that you told us that you retired at 85, but it doesn't seem like you've spent much time off the ice. So, you know, what is the longest you've gone without teaching? Um, when I was in, when I was in, uh, when I was mistakenly working for my father in the business in, in England, uh, when he and I did not see eye to eye, I was off the ice, I think, for about six months then. Often I was off the ice, I think three months when I, I broke my foot in South Africa. And that's, uh, that's been about it. And, uh, but you know, ice skating is, uh, I'm so supportive of it. It uh, teaches so many things to a skater. You know, the ability to understand music, to perform the music, to understand audiences, to understand how to work with people to be very courageous. I mean, as you know, you can fall, looks easy and smooth, but the great skaters fall and they fall and they hurt themselves and they have to have the courage uh, to get up and do it again. So figure skating teaches a young person so much. I'm very, very supportive of it. Uh, in fact, I've taught, I think, I keep pretty good records. I've taught over 1,400 uh, skaters and um, I can count almost on two hands a number of those skaters that I know that have got into really good trouble. Um, I think that the figure skating is, is a wonderful start for a young person, teaches them so much. Well, have you ever, have ever, taught, adults? ever taught adults? Yes, I have. I taught a, a lady, I think it was a 55 years old, who was actually convinced her double soccer was clean. <laughs> Couldn't talk her out of it. <laughs> Sounds like an adult skater. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Yes. Nick. We've so yes. enjoyed getting to know you and, and yes. learn from you. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I hope you, uh, I cu hope you cut the appropriate uh, Times, all right? Yes. <laughs> bye bye. Well, well, thank you. And again, thank you for giving us so much of your time. And I hope the rest of quarantine goes well for you and all of your training for races. And we hope to see more pictures of you in the rink in the future. Yeah. Too. Well, I'm, I'm now going to go out to supper with my son and daughter and a nice glass of Chianti and hope not to remember all the silly things I've said tonight. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>